Hey everybody, and welcome to a new video. Are you frustrated with using entry-level gear and wanting pro results? Or do you want the real answer to the age-old question, does gear matter? In this video, we're going to have a battle between this setup I bought used for 700 US dollars and this setup, which costs $18,000, and teach you the tips which can close the gap without buying new gear. Make sure you stay till the end where I show you which camera took this photo and you may be surprised. My name is Simon Dantremont and I'm a professional nature and wildlife photographer living in Eastern Canada. I make weekly videos giving you photo tips or taking you behind the scenes for wildlife and nature photography. Subscribe if you want to see more. So you've all seen the videos and articles online with the subject, Does Gear Matter? with strong feelings on either side of gear doesn't matter at all or of course gear matters. I don't think either of these statements hits the mark. I believe the only way to answer this question in a way that is 100% truthful and accurate is with the following two statements. One, the amount of difference in results between pro gear and entry level gear depends greatly on the genre of photography that you shoot and two, in the right hands, the difference is less. For example, some genres like wildlife and astrophotography use very specialized gear and for a good reason. The kit zoom lens that came with your camera isn't going to give you the reach that this monster can. Or this 20mm f1.4 lens with amazing light gathering capability will deliver results in astrophotography that this kit lens can't. But in some genres where the gear is less specialized, the difference between entry level and pro setups is much less. Let's look at the five ways how they're different and how to use that entry level setup to make up the difference. The competitors, my full frame Canon R5, my Sigma Art 50 mm f1.4, my Canon 17 to 40 f4 L, and my Canon RF 600 mm f4 versus a used Canon M50 I bought used for $500 US, including the kit 15 to 45 lens and a Canon 70 to 300 f4 to f5.6 zoom lens I bought used for $200 US, $700 US total. I spent the last week taking shots with both cameras to compare. Let's get into these differences. First, in those genres that value a blurry background like portrait or product photography, inexpensive lenses that usually come with the camera aren't very fast. That is, they don't have a very wide aperture. This kit lens on my M50 has a maximum aperture of f4 at 15 millimeters and f6.3 at 45 millimeters. Or the zoom lens goes from f4 to f5.6. That means that the background is quite a bit in focus compared to the pro setup. Let's look at some shots taken with this setup using my owl buddy as a model. First, with the budget M50 and kit lens, this looks okay, but let's compare it to the pro gear like my full frame and Sigma Art f1.4. You'll notice that the pro setup with wider aperture lens can obliterate the background. How do we make up the difference to make the budget setup look as great? Here are a few tricks. First, longer focal length lenses have shallower depths of field, even with slightly smaller apertures. So if we substitute the kit lens on my M50 with the longer focal length 70 to 300, look what happens. The background is enlarged behind our subject, making it look blurrier and less distracting. The subject now pops out of the frame. So for that portrait shot, use the long focal length lens. Two, the farther the background is from your subject, the more out of focus and blurrier it will be. So place your subject where the background is farther back and the background will get much smoother. In wildlife photography, this is done by getting down low if your subject is low, like ducks in the water. If you get low at eye level, you can get the background to be much farther away. And third, getting closer to your subject makes the depth of field thinner. Maybe taking a smaller slice of them and the background will get smoother, making your subject pop from the frame. One of the prized attributes of lenses like the 600 mm f4 is its ability to blow out that background, like in these photos I took last week along with the M50. How do we lessen the gap between it and the M50 with the 70 to 300 mm lens? Here's a shot of this duck taken from a standing position, but look what happens when I get down low. I get a smoother background and it really helps me get the subject to pop from the frame and shoot tame subjects so you can get closer, which as we saw earlier, will make the background smoother. Go to your local duck pond or park where birds are more used to people. 
These shots were all taken with the M50 and the budget 70 to 300 millimeter lens. The low angle and getting close really helps the subject stand out. Here are the two setups compared to each other. Not the same, but we've closed the gap with good technique. Another difference that's a feature of an entry level setup compared to pro gear is sharpness. More expensive lenses that pros use not only have larger maximum apertures compared to your kit lens that came with your camera, but are usually sharper. This raises a couple of issues. First, is sharpness a defining feature of your genre of photography? In some styles like portrait photography, people don't always want the sharpest lens. It shows off imperfections in the skin and is sometimes less flattering. Some people use old vintage lenses for portraits because they're less sharp. So for portraiture, the gap between pro gear and budget gear may be less. In landscape or architecture photography, the news is great on the sharpness front and a real chance for entry level gear to play catch up. That's because most landscape and architecture photography is done by trying to capture the whole scene in focus. And you do this by using a small aperture, a large F number like F7.1, F8 or F9. Guess what? Most kit lenses are sharpest at those apertures, a great way to reduce the gap. So here I'm shooting this lighthouse with both the M50 with kit lens, as well as my R5 full frame with a 17 to 40 L lens. I'm using a tripod so I can shoot long shutter speeds and keep the ISO low for best image quality. Now when you pixel peep, can you tell the difference in sharpness between the two setups? Yes, you can. But if these two photos were going up on Instagram to be viewed small on a phone, they would be difficult to tell apart. This is one scenario where the budget setup can be very competitive. Be careful shooting into the sun though while shooting landscapes. If you look at these two images from the different setups, the budget setup will have more flares and artifacts and blow out the highlights faster than pro gear. That's because it has less dynamic range. Use exposure bracketing to try to retain some of those highlights with the budget setup. Sharpness is also a prized attribute of these long super telephoto lenses. This is one issue where the gap is larger. The cost to manufacture of these lenses to be so sharp makes them terribly expensive. Some mitigations though. One, lenses like these can be cropped deeply and retain tons of detail, like in this example. But budget gear isn't going to be as croppable like this and leave lots of detail. Shoot wildlife subjects where you can get close so you don't need to crop your images as much. You may be thinking that wildlife doesn't let you get close. Ah, that's where field craft and experience come into play. When I thought to myself this week, what wildlife will let me get close with this M50 here in Nova Scotia in winter? I thought, aha, purple sandpipers. This Arctic species is very tolerant of people if you have the right technique. Lay down on the ground like a seal. Don't stand up and don't move and they'll walk right by you while feeding and you won't be impacting their natural behavior. Here I am taking shots with both setups. I was close enough that I don't need to crop the photos taken with my M50. Are the shots from my pro setup sharper? Here they are compared to each other. Yes, of course the pro setup is sharper. But are these shots from the M50 okay? Sure they are. The next area where we need some technique to make up the difference between budget and pro gear is low light performance and higher ISOs. Professional gear often has the latest in technology and the sensors in more expensive gear may be larger, like this full frame camera, versus budget gear that often has smaller sensors, less expensive to manufacture. These smaller sensors aren't as good in low light, here are two shots with the same high 12,800 ISO on both cameras with the same settings. You can see that my professional gear does a better job and yields a cleaner image. So what's the equalizer for the budget setup? The first and easiest equalizer is light. Shoot when the light is good with a budget setup. Shoot in the daytime or outside where there's much more light than indoors. If you're indoors or where the sun is hidden, head to a window or where some light is getting in. You can also add light with a flash, reflector, or LED panel. But what about dark scenes where you can't add light? Your friend and equalizer here is the tripod. That's because for the budget camera, you want to gather as much light as you can, and the best way is to have very long shutter speeds. And to have sharp images with that, you need to stabilize the camera. So for nighttime street scenes or for moon shots, use a tripod and use a shutter release or two second timer to not shake the camera while triggering the shutter. Here are two shots taken at the same low ISO 100 on a tripod, opening the shutter for 30 seconds to get in lots of light onto that sensor. The shots between the two setups are actually very similar. 
When shooting in dark scenarios with budget gear, try focusing on static targets or ask your subjects to stand very still so you can gather more light. If you're feeling adventurous, don't forget that if you put your camera with a long shutter speed on a tripod and there's movement in the scene, you can make art from the streaks. Use the so-called disadvantage to your advantage. While we're on the topic of tripods, don't forget that they're also a great equalizer for another advantage that pro setups have, image or sensor stabilization. The pro setups can be handheld for longer exposures without blurring and can take sharper images handheld because the lenses or the sensors are stabilized. Use the tripod to close the gap on this issue too. Some entry level cameras do have stabilization in the camera or on the lens. Make sure you turn this on to make sure it's working. A caution that on some cameras, the stabilization that you can turn on in the menus is for video only. So that might not apply to still images. The next difference that Budget Gear has from Pro Gear is its autofocus capability. Newer and more modern Pro mirrorless cameras have amazing autofocus and eye detect features that make locking onto your subject easier. They also have more focus points or wider coverage of the sensor versus a small number of focus points compared to Budget Gear. So how do we equalize this advantage? One, this is another reason to shoot in good light. Poor lighting conditions will make autofocus even more difficult, revealing the weakness in your autofocus system. Shoot in more light if you can and your autofocus will be more responsive. Two, add a few more focus points if you can, rather than just one. You may improve your chances of locking on, especially for moving subjects. But note that it may be less precise. One focus point focused on the eye may be the best way to get that portrait or wildlife shot looking the best as they look best with a nice sharp eye. Three, many cameras focus systems are based on detecting the difference between two phases of the scene. When you separate the phases of this plain wall, there's not enough difference between the two views for the camera to know which way to adjust for focus. But look what happens when I point at a nice vertical line. The two phases are easily distinguished. What's the solution here? Point your focus point at the edge of your subject, not its body, or point to anything in the scene with lines or detail. Your camera will lock on faster. And finally, fast moving targets are really hard for entry level setups. The cameras often don't have as sophisticated a setup for the detection of movement, and the focus motors in the lenses don't react as fast. The best solution here, it's what's called pre-focusing. That means pointing the camera and focusing on something that's close to where you expect the action to happen. When the action does arrive, the camera and lens don't have to react as fast nor move as far to get focus, speeding up the process and improving its accuracy. And I promised you a bonus tip and that was to reveal what setup got this photo. It was a trick question, but one with a point to make. This shot was taken with my 600 millimeter F4 but on this M50 with an adapter. Is there a difference between this and what my R5 would have gotten? Yes, my full frame high megapixel R5 would have gotten more detail and see this little spot here? That's a blown out highlight because of the budget camera sensor has less dynamic range. World ending for the photo? No. So what's the point here of this weird combination? It's that an amazing lens can make an average camera much better. The kit lens that comes with a camera usually isn't very good, as they're made inexpensively to keep the price of the camera competitive, and they're usually the weak point in the setup. But sharpness, light gathering capacity, and ability to make the background blurry are lens attributes, not camera attributes. This video isn't designed to make you lust for gear, but rather to get great results with what you have. But if an upgrade is what you want someday, consider getting a great lens for your existing camera before getting a new camera. It's by far the best next purchase to accompany a budget or starter camera. Adding a $300 Sigma 30 millimeter F1.4 lens on this basic little camera will turn it into a powerhouse for landscapes, portraiture, street photography, and architecture. Way more light, smoother bokeh, much better image quality, and much sharper than the kit lens. If all this talk about image quality has you wondering what else you can do to improve it in your photography, check out my video on that subject right here. If you found this video deserving, please give it a like so other photographers with budget gear can also get great photos. And I hope you can use these tips to take whatever gear you have and just go out and enjoy using it. And yes, give the pros a run for their money. I know you can do it.